Um, my name is Andrew Stevens, and I'm, I guess I'm the moderator and first speaker. Dr. Pomper is here also. He'll give the next talk. And what I've been charged with today is to give a, 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 a conversation or have a conversation with you about uh, sort of real-life develop, development of pharmaceutical uh, agents, and I wanted to use flobetabine, which is an amyloid agent, as an example, and try and use it to highlight some of the points that the, that we went around in terms of getting the the the, uh, the compound approved, and to talk about things that might be important for you. So, I'm uh, an employee of Pyramal Imaging, um, which is based in Berlin. Um, this is only for educational purposes, and flobetabine is not is an investigational agent which has not been approved. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today is uh, addressing an unmet medical need, generation and optimization of a new pet tracer, overview of preclinical and clinical development, the regulatory requirements for approval, and the effect of clinical management and health economics and outcome aspects. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the slideshow and then just sort of annotate it with, with areas that to, to be uh, particularly interesting for you and that we're going to need to focus on as we go forward. So just as a, this isn't an advertisement, it's just people don't know who Pyramol is. And Pyramol is a Swiss-based company with a German uh, uh, R&D subsidiary um, that was founded a year ago from the molecular asset, molecular imaging assets of Bayer, uh, Bayer Healthcare. It was picked up by uh, Pyramol, uh, the company, the Pyramol Group, which is a company which has, which is Mumbai based in India, it has a global research and innovation focus, and is one of the largest diversified companies uh, uh, in India. Um, the topic we're going to be talking about today is Alzheimer's disease and amyloid imaging. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is 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 an often misdiagnosed uh, uh, disease, and is a growing healthcare problem in the world today. Ten to thirty percent of the diagnosis. Um, based on clinical examinations are incorrect. That's with people who have uh, uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. As you move earlier and earlier into mild cognitive uh, impairment and subjective memory complaints, that misdiagnosis rate goes up significantly. Um, and so we need to have better ways to, to diagnose Alzheimer's disease and to understand what the pathophysiology is if we stand a chance to um, be able to treat this disease uh, going forward in the years to come. It's estimated that 35 million people in the world are living with some kind of dementia and two-thirds of this is Alzheimer's disease and the cost of Alzheimer's disease is really skyrocketing and is estimated to be over one trillion dollars by 2050. Okay, the disease is a long disease. It, it takes a long time to occur, and as and I think the imaging studies have actually uh, been instrumental in understanding some of the pathophysiology and the natural history of this disease. What we knew from before, previously, the diagnosis had to be made um, by autopsy studies looking at plaques and tangles um, at the time of a patient's death. Now we can start looking in vivo. Um, when patients are still living and it gives us a window into looking at how that disease is developing and one of the things you can see here is that this is data from Chris Rowe um, in Australia and, and and if you look at the time between the mean um, this is this is quantitative uptake of, of this is SUVR data so it's it's the mean quantitative uptake of, of a PET scan um, of a patient with Alzheimer's disease compared to a patient with uh, with who's a healthy patient the the time to uh, to to develop the time of plaque deposition is between 19 years where it's abnormal and really uh, almost 30 years between it's above the normal Normal, val normal mean value for SUVR. So you can see that this is a very, very uh, a long chronic disease. One of the things when we talk about therapeutic interventions is, is, is that typically the intervention trials have been occurring here at the onset of, of known AD, and those trials have been almost a universal failure. And what we're seeing is that the therapeutic trials are moving earlier um, at, at a time when there's still um, uh, Alzheimer, there's still amyloid deposition, but in which um, in which you might have a better chance to treat this disease. But in order to do this, we really need good biomarkers in order to, to, to understand who to treat and who not to. 
Um, what I wanted to try and go through again is that this is a, just a generalized scheme from preclinical development first in man and then some of, the, some of the points of phase one, phase two, and phase three. In molecular imaging, we still need to do all of these things and we need to think about the different steps that come in uh, along the lines and I want to talk about some of those things. Um, particularly with phase one, we need to deal with safety, PK dosimetry. Phase two, we need to have more safety and efficacy. We really need to understand image acquisition and the readout protocols as early as possible. And phase three, we need to still, again, efficacy and safety always. We're always building our safety database. And we need to work with pivotal studies. And one of the things there is we need to have buy-in from the FDA about what our standard of truth is and how we're going to be doing those studies. And I'll, go, I'll be going through that. All the way along this process, we have to, we have to um, continue to develop our chemistry and manufacturing so that by the time we have a approved product, we have a robust manufacturing process uh, that can be distributed uh, throughout the country or throughout the world. And this is a particular challenge for uh, radio pharmaceuticals in which with fluorine 18, we have a two hour half-life. Um, but I think that in, some, in a number of other agents, you're also going to have challenges of CMC, challenges of generating a, an, approved, an, uh, an approved manufacturing process that can be distributed globally throughout all the hospitals. Um, this is the compound. This is a, this is a still bean derivative. This, I, I'm not going to go into the chemistry a lot. This came from the pioneering work of Hank Kung, um, where he found that these, that, that these, um, these phenyl rings in this conjugated system could intercalate into the beta pleated sheets of, of amyloid plaques. It was, it was specific and didn't have binding to the tau tangles, pick bodies or Lewy bodies, and, and that you could put a peg linker on it and then an F18 in order to tag this uh, for uh, radio diagnostic purposes. It does have the ability to, to, to cross the blood-brain barrier, which is obviously key in, in the Alzheimer's or the amyloid deposition in the brain. Uh, um, uh, problem here. Um, this is a preclinical model so that continue to be developed. There are a number of transgenic mice. This is the APP SWE mouse in work that was done by Alex Rominger and, and, and Peter Bartenstein in Munich. And you can see that, that they now have a, a well-structured, well well-understood, well-characterized um, mouse model in which you can see uh, generation of, of, of the A-beta plaques which you can then image with micro, uh, micro pet and corresponds to CT or to autoradiography. This is critical to develop good, good animal models, good preclinical models, both in terms of establishing uh, how you're going to run the clinical studies and also particularly in the, in the Alzheimer's uh, situation and understanding and having good animal models to, uh, to, to drive your, your therapeutic trials. And so understanding how the, the plaque forms and being able to image it in vivo really will help us going forward in terms of developing therapeutics. Um, again, this is sort of a, a, a recap of some of the things you need to think about. I know that you know I was on the research side for a long time and what, uh, you know, what we were always thinking about most is, is simply can you have a ligand that binds tightly to a, to a to a, a pathological protein, and the focus was always on KD and some on PK, um, and 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 so we got to about this part and and never thought very much further. But you have to remember that as you go forward in development, you need this this is a must. So you need to have the science behind you. That's for sure. You also need to have the pharmacokinetics distribution metabolism profiles worked out. And then as you go forward, you're going to need to to build in more safety and toxicology. This is what the FDA cares a lot about. Um, and so you're going to need uh, uh, neurology, cardiovascular, respiratory safety studies. These can be farmed out, but they, they need to be performed. Fortunately for imaging agents, in which there usually is not a big uh, safety concern, certainly not with the, with the PET agents, uh, you can get into the clinic with a single dose, single species uh, toxicity study. But as you go further and further along your development pathway, you're going to need multiple doses and multiple species. You have to think about how you're going to build that into your development plan. Okay, this is sort of a, a, an example of a, a um, we'll use it as the first in man study. Is is the, the first in man study was done um, down in Australia again by Chris Rowe, um, in which uh, very quickly in the first ten patients he was able to see a significant difference in the in the images of patients, uh, young healthy patients without uh, amyloid deposition compared to. Um, um, patients with clinical Alzheimer's disease that had significant uh, plaque and significant plaque deposition as viewed by flobetabine. 
Okay. Um, we were able, the beauty of, of radio pharmaceutics, obviously, is that you can do uh, good in vivo uh, pharmacokinetics and understand the disease. And one of the things you can see here, and it's, it's something that we always have to think about with, with the amyloid agents uh, particularly, is that, is that the background isn't static, is that if, if you look at um, if you look at the white matter, what you see is, is, is it comes up rapidly, okay? Um, so, so what we're looking at is, is, is it comes, is, the, is the, the drug comes into the brain very rapidly and then comes down, also washes out of the brain, but there's a significant difference between the white matter and the gray matter in, in, the, um, in, the, in the patients of Alzheimer's disease, which you don't see in the patients of, of healthy volunteers. So it's always a slippery slope, and so that if you're looking at, at, at time points, that, that drop is always occurring, but what you're looking is, at, at is the ratio, and the ratio for flobetabine is very, very constant and very steady from about 60 minutes on to about 200 minutes. It just seems it's a very linear ratio, which allows you to do quantitation and allows you over the years to look at repeat, do to repeat imaging to see whether you've changed this or whether the patients are accumulating dose. And I'll show you some data about that uh, a little bit later on. Um, we, there was a standard, sort of a research standard in the amyloid field, which was PIB, which is Pittsburgh uh, protein, Pittsburgh compound B, um, again, uh, that was developed in Hank Kung's lab, and so that's a C11 compound, um, which is not a compound that could be used for commercial development, but could be used in specialized imaging centers. And what we were able to show is that, is that flobetabine was able to differentiate as well as PIB um, between healthy controls and AD patients, and indeed, if you looked at the, if you looked at quantitation at the SCVR uh, uptake, uh, comparing PIB to, uh, to flobetabine, you saw that there was a very tight correlation uh, between uptake of PIB and uptake of flobetabine, with a slope of 0.71 and a very good R value. Um, this gave us good confidence that we were seeing what we wanted to be seeing, and and that we we would have a successful development path. So the, this is sort of an overall schema of the, of the development path that we, that we took. Um, we ran a number of POM studies and phase one studies, as we talked about, looking at safety, dosimetry, pharmacokinetics, at different ethnic populations and mass dose. Mass dose is something that's important, again, for radio pharmaceuticals, because I think that in some situations you might have a very low uh, prevalence targets in which you have a high affinity, and that what you need to do is you need to make sure that you have a very high specific activity ligand, and that if you do get lower specific, low, spec, uh, low specific activity, you'll have dilution or competition. In the case of amyloid, what we found is that you have a, a lot of target, and the ability to saturate that target is, is very limited. This allows us to work with a range of specific activity and to have a functional half-life of over 10 hours, even though the, radio, the radiological half-life of fluorine is only two hours. So we can use a, a large degree of specific activity, but it's certainly something you're going to need to think about going forward. We ran uh, two, three actually large phase uh, two studies. We ran a global phase two study in, in two parts, 150 patients and 272 patients, and then a study in Downs, which I won't talk about today, but Downs patients uh, have a, have a gene duplication of the, of the amyloid precursor, and those patients will all generate, will all develop amyloid plaques by the age of 50. And so there's a very interesting uh, natural history of, of, of plaque generation, uh, which is specific to the Down uh, syndrome patients. Uh, then we looked at a pivotal study, hi, pivotal histopathology study. There was long discussions with the FDA about how to do a pivotal study with amyloid imaging, and the decision was made that what, we, what you needed to do is to do end-of-life patients image them and then on their death uh, to harvest the brains and look for amyloid deposition uh, and compare it to the to the PET scan. I'll go into that a little bit more more uh, in more detail. And then a pooled read study, we combined a lot of the uh, images from, from a number of these studies. Uh, overall we had, in the pooled read study, we had 461 images. Overall in the development program, we had almost 900 images uh, that was submitted to the FDA. So, um, and, and, and here, what's really critically important is that you have a clinically uh, accessible, uh, applicable visual assessment. And the FDA has been very, very um, interested and rigid about understanding that everybody can read the, the scans or can read the images that, that, that your particular agent uh, will, will generate. And I think the harder it is to 
read those images, the more time that you need to spend figuring out a consistent reproducible way. And they always talk about that they want to be able to know that a nuclear medicine physician in our situation can, re in North Dakota with no specific training, can read these images. Um, and so it's not just a specialized, manif a specialized uh, process. If you're working with um, very, very high-tech other agents, again, they're going to be very suspect that, the, that um, the community physicians will be able to read these agents uh, going forward and you're going to have to think about how to do that. Okay. So in the process of our development, we, d we developed a robust and high-yield manufacturing process. Um, again, we have a shelf life of 10 hours, which is, which is remarkable for a pet agent. Uh, we have an excellent safety profile and diagnostic performance. And so the regulatory requirements for approval, we need a direct correlation of amyloid deposition um, and tracer uptake in, the, in, the, in an anatomic region. We needed robust visual assessments, which I, which I just talked about and important prognostic and predictive information for MCI patients. Okay, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So this is just a generalized slide, but I think it brings home the, uh, another point that I wanted to make that people don't often uh, think about so much because when you're into, th into the research, you, you, you sort of understand what you're doing. And, and this is going to be what you need to do for your pivotal study. You're going to have to come up with just a sense and spec, a, four, a, a two by two table. And, and I think that the, the, the challenges here are the visual assessment is do you have a standardized visual assessment and you need two pivotal studies that will show that standardized visual assessment methodology and what's your standard of truth and I think that this is this is certainly something that spent we spent a lot of time with with the FDA understanding what the standard of truth was and coming to the decision that it was a histopathology uh, um, assessment of the brain I think that as you have more and more novel compounds in which there isn't potentially a known standard of truth there's you're going to struggle more and more with the FDA about what you compare it to so what are you going to compare it to your agent to that's in the field that a regulatory agency is going to understand. And, and they, I can tell you, are somewhere around 10 to 20 years behind the times. And so what you consider standard of truth might not at all be what they consider standard of truth. And so it really, you really need to spend a little bit of time with the FDA understanding this, because if you don't get this right, then you're going to run a big clinical study, and they're going to invalidate it as saying it doesn't use the, the, the proper endpoints. So very, very important. Um, this is the study that we ended up designing, and so this was, as, as we said, we took this sort of a next step forward over some of the other amyloid agents where we imaged end-of-life patients and that on their death we autopsied the brain and took out very particular uh, regions. Okay, six very particular regions of the brain. These were, um, we had also done MRIs prior to death. Then we could, um, we could take photo, uh, photographs of this and, co and co-register the photographs and the region taken with the MRI and generate M and then the MRI could be fused and co-registered with a PET scan. So within this process we could have an exact uh, transfer of the tissue that was taken out of the brain by photomicrograph and used for histology to a region of interest on the PET scan. And this allowed us then um, to show, and, and then we went back in and to show amyloid uptake or, or, or flobetabine uptake in a particular region, which corresponded to a, partic a very particular exact uh, f uh, histopathology or pathological region, which you could then stain for, for amyloid, for beta amyloid plaques here. This is a Bilshofsky stain. And so you had a very a, a good one-to-one -one correlation exactly showing that the areas that you're imaging are the areas that, uh, that have the plaque. Here's a negative section where you did the same, the same thing. Here's the, here's the region of interest. You cut it out, and here you don't have plaque. And so here in this situation, you can say, where I have flobetabine image, I can show exactly in that histologic region that I don't have, or, or in the positive images that I do have plaque, and in the negative images I don't have plaque. And this is, these sorts of images were, were these sorts of studies were critical um, to, to get the FDA to buy into the idea that we could, what they call staining, that we could in vivo stain uh, agents um, for the exact pathology that we were looking for. This is the, this is a this is another uh, a key area and and uh, you know it seems 
to people in the field, it doesn't seem so uh, something they might think about so much. I know I didn't think about it so much previously, but having a good reading methodology and having a reproducible, robust reading methodology is absolutely critical. And so we had to spend a lot of time over the course of the phase twos modifying and tweaking our read, even though the, from a subjective point of view, you say, oh, this is negative and this is positive. We needed a set of rules, formalized, structured rules for saying why this is negative, why this is positive. Um, and then that needed to be transferred. All of the companies with amyloid imaging agents were forced to have a, a teacher independent protocol, so a web-based training program that would allow anybody in the field after three hours of training or four hours of training on this web-based or CD-based training protocol to have minimum um, expertise at reading these images. They were very concerned that people, again, that the readers were, were going to be from, from universities who did a lot of this, but then the drug was going to get out into the community and the people in the community were not going to have the experience that they needed. And so they, they have been um, just really very dogmatic about needing a very structured reading program and it's something you have to think about. If, you're, if your agent, whatever that might be, happens to be need quantitative analysis, that's something that's going to need even more assessment. I mean, the FDA has been very uh, slow to take on the, 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 the quantitative aspects and so if, you're work, if you need a program to analyze the data, you're going to really have to work hard with the FDA to make sure that that's standardized, that the machines are standardized, the acquisition is standardized, and that the, and that the data processing is standardized. Um, so this is, this is what we were able to do in this situation is, is that we were able to have a, a subject level pet assessment based on three, majority, three readers with a majority read. This was in person training, um, which was considered, uh, which, which could be considered um, uh, not pivotal, but, but um, ex you know, that could add to the, add to the, to the, to the dossier, um, but using exactly the same methodology that the, that the, that the uh, web-based training had later on. And here you can see in the first 31 patients, here's a positive scan, negative scan by the criteria, and looking at histopathology, A beta present or no A beta pre present, we had a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 92%. So, so really very high sensitivity and specificity for these agents. Um, relevant for all the tracers is, is, is this is something, again, that I think that we haven't been thinking about so much, but which is getting to be a, a, a bigger and bigger issue, is that, is that you can get FDA approval, but if you don't get reimbursement, you're not going to make any money on it. And this is what we've seen. Uh, and with the pet agents particularly, the, state, the, the, the Medicare uh, group has been very slow to approve uh, pet agents. Uh, FDG was in TOBRA for a long, long time. Uh, the, FD, the FDG for uh, for brain imaging was very slow to come along. To come along, I think Dr. Pomper can talk about FDG for prostate has just been approved for reimbursement now after these years, um, and so you really need to think about how to do that. And what the CMS is looking for is they're looking for a clinical value or benefit. And if you can build these into your clinical trials earlier, the better off you'll be. And the, the issue with amyloid is that, is that there aren't any therapeutic interventions at this time. Um, and so going forward, we don't know uh, whether knowing you have a head full of amyloid makes a difference in terms of your quality of life. We all think it does, but we have to show it explicitly to the, to the Medicare Medicaid in order to get reimbursement. So I would just challenge you to every time you're thinking about developing a study, think about what the clinical benefit or the outcomes would be that would make Medicare happy and help your course along the way, because otherwise you're going to be, you're going to be in a situation where you're going to have an approval and you're going to have a huge post-approval commitment to run more clinical studies to show outcome. Okay. Um, this is, these are two studies that I just wanted to show thinking about the kind of ways that we think about outcome. This is a, this is a, this is a study that was done again in Australia and the, and the first part of this is to look at patients with healthy controls and this is SCVR, so this is quantitative uh, assessment with a threshold analysis of 1.4 which is determined for normals and you see that you have, these are patients, healthy patients, these are patients with Alzheimer's disease, with known clinical Alzheimer's disease and this is a population which is probably the intent to treat population for, for the amyloid agents, flabetabine, um, is an MCI population, a mild cognitive impaired and there you have a very uh, wide 
widespread and you have a multiplicity of diseases. And so this is where you can really add value by having an amyloid scan. In this series um, of 45 patients, about they, they roughly broke into half the group uh, had, had what would be considered an amyloid positive scan by threshold analysis, half had a negative scan, and then these patients were followed for two years. And over two years, of the, uh, of the 53 patients, 75 percent, 18 of 24, went on to develop um, a clinical Alzheimer's disease within two years. Of the patients that had an amyloid negative scan, only two patients of those converted to AD. Okay, so, so we, have a, we have a very strong prognostic factor now that if you have mild cognitive impairment and you have a positive scan, the likelihood of you going on to developing Alzheimer's in the next two to four years is very, very high. We've now followed this for four years, and that number goes up to 85%, and so it just continues to grow. And so the negative predictive value in this situation is very high and, is a, and, and we think contributes greatly to the, to the value of the drug, is if you have a negative scan, um, and MCI, the likelihood that you're going to develop uh, Alzheimer's disease in the next several years is very low. And these patients go on to develop, uh, have a much more stuttering, uh, benign, chronic sort of course, whereas these patients really have an inexorable decline and, and will uh, develop clinical Alzheimer's in the next several years. Um, finally, we've looked at, 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 at patient confidence and it's interesting is so if we first looked at in the phase two patients and here's 200 201 patients where we had uh unimpaired controls and probable AD patients, and we looked at the, at the controls and we saw what was the likelihood of those patients having, having a positive outcome, and it turned out that 80% of the patients that had no symptoms had a negative scan, 14 had a positive scan. That's not unexpected from what we've seen before. There will be uh, healthy patients with a, positive, uh, with a positive scan, and what we don't know about that is whether this is benign now or whether this has to do with uh, those patients are just earlier on in the spectrum of developing Alzheimer's disease, and I think that that's one of the really interesting questions and we're trying to find these patients now and find out what's happening to them. And then in the probable AD patients, again, you have 80% of those patients do have positive scans, so everybody feels good that they, they, they made the right diagnosis. But here you have 22, you have about 18% of the patients that had a negative scan. And so these are patients that, that may have uh, uh, the wrong diagnosis and patients should, and people and physicians should be looking harder to understand what the real uh, diagnosis there is and if there's anything treatable there. Um, and then when you look at, 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 at phys physician confidence, what you can see, these are now looking at the, I gotta get this right, this is, this is now expanding this group, right? So you take this and you blow it up, and what you find out is that these patients have the, 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 the physician confidence of this diagnosis of these 22 patients was much decreased. The, the, the physician confidence of these 82 percent of, of the patients was much uh, was either increased or unchanged. And so you can see that the, the, even though patients or physicians say that they know how to diagnose Alzheimer's disease, they don't always get it right, and that having a scan improves their physician confidence and lets them act with, uh, with more security that, they, that they're doing the right thing for their patients. Um, this is just to say that these problems are not unique. The problems I've outlined with, with, with flobetabine for Alzheimer's disease are, are not unique to this particular tracer. What, the things that I've been talking about go across all of the compounds. Here's a number of the, of the compounds that pyramidal imaging has in their pipeline, and we will have to deal with and are working on how to develop things like pivotal trials and, and health outcomes research in all of our oncology um, uh, agents also. So in summary, flobetabine is a robust product with, uh, with demonstrated ability to, to detect AV plaques. Evidence is obtained that flobetabine uh, uptake in MCI is related to symptom clinical symptomatology and progression. The implication for development of future PET tracers, I, I can't overestimate or understate this enough, is that, is that this is really important, and it seems crazy for me as a researcher talking about health economics and outcome studies, but this is what's going to make or break it as a commercial product. And, and finally, approval is prerequisite for market access, but reimbursement is, is, is prerequisite for market success. So with that, I'd like to stop. I'd like to thank the patients and the families and the investigators and all the collaborators who have been part of this. Um,